it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. In this world around us, with all this political upheaval and nation rising against nation, all sorts of things that are going on in these perilous times, you know, th this country that we live in and the cities of the nations around the world have just come into perilous, perilous times. There are all sorts of international tension that take place all over the world. We've got all kind of strange things happening in the weather and weather patterns that are ch changing, you know, earthquakes, volcanoes, a horrible ice storm with the low zero temperatures in Texas, people. I mean, that is unreal. We've got all kind of signs in the heavens with the blood moons and the eclipses and all of these things are going on and brothers and sisters all of these things have been happening they've been earthquakes volcanoes tidal waves all these things have gone on throughout the years and throughout history people just keep on living going day by day working uh partying giving in marriage living life whatever and throughout all the world as life continues and the world turns people just continue living their lives and then all of a sudden there is some rumbling that happens in the Middle East and then this rumbling is centered around talk of a of a peace treaty a new peace deal between Israel and the surrounding nations of Israel and then all of a sudden we have this peace treaty announced but even before that even before that Israel starts building a temple they start building their temple and, of course, we've always been told that the temple would not be built until Daniel's 70th week. But these are all theories, and none of us actually know what's going on, although the prophecy pundits of our day act like they have a crystal ball that they can gaze into the future. And, anyway, Israel is now breaking ground for their temple. You know, it, it takes them a few years to get it. Um, and then a peace agreement happens. Or maybe maybe the temple is built in, before the peace agreement. But the issue is a seven-year peace treaty has been cut. A peace deal has been made. And, you know, maybe it's named something like, hmm, I don't know, the Abraham Accords? But instead of the Christians being happy and excited that these things are happening and we are going into the end times and we're getting closer to when we're going to see our king, in this scenario that I'm giving you, the Christians have fallen into a state of panic. And the reason why they are panicking is 
Because they have been told all their lives, all along, their mothers, their fathers, their grandfathers, their pastors, their prophets have told them and taught them all their lives that the church would be gone when this covenant was signed. They were all taught that before these things even came to pass, the church would be gone. But here this seven-year covenant has been signed and the church is still here. The church is not gone. And so panic has set in. Uncertainty is abound. The Christian world is in an uproar because now Christians have begun to become persecuted all over the world. Now the church is already persecuted in the church in China and the Middle East, places to where they've been living in tribulation the entire time. You know, they they will cut your head off in most Muslim countries for, for proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. But now, now, brothers and sisters, here in America, persecution has begun. You know, things have changed on the earth. And now being a Christian puts a price on your head. The seven-year covenant is signed. The temple mount is going. The animals are being sacrificed again. And there were several people who were involved in this covenant. But it was all centered around this one individual. There was one individual who made this covenant come to pass. He strengthened and backed, or as Daniel 9.27 says, he confirmed the covenant with the many. He backs it. You know, it doesn't say that he will sign it. It says that he will confirm it. He will strengthen it. The guy that is going to be the Antichrist, he isn't the Antichrist yet now. He won't be the Antichrist until... Uh, the halfway, really like three and a half years later, you know, he'll become the Antichrist then, but he has not become the Antichrist yet. But the contract is signed. Peace and a Middle East now comes. But Christians are freaking out. And then, one day, the guy that was peaceful who promised peace all over the world, who promised this global international peace. He has his global international agenda to unite the world in one government, one banking, one religion, all of that. This same guy, he's the one that gave all the promises. But now that there seems to be some real stability in the Middle East. As things, as time gets closer and closer to that three and a half year period, we get closer and closer to that point. This guy keeps talking and promising and he keeps uh, using what Daniel says is, uh, you know, kind of like a, a, a subtle slyness is the the kind of the way that I see it happening. You know, he's, he does not come to power through, uh, through war or necessarily through military might, but because of his tongue, he is a smooth talker. He confirms this covenant and he walks in, we get to this three and a half period and he walks into the Holy of Holies in the temple. He sits on the throne of God and declares himself to be God. Again, Christians are freaking out because under the pre-trib scenario, 
they should have already been gone. The way Hal Lindsey and Dr. Walvoord and Dr. Pentecost and Tim LaHaye and Jack Van Empey and and all these other pre-trib people and the prophecy pundits, they say that the church should have already been gone. John MacArthur said the church would not be here. But come to find out, brothers and sisters, that was all smokescreen. It was all a pipe dream. It was all fantasy. Now, Christians have a price on their head. And we are finally seeing the truth. But because many of those Christians were superficial Christians in the first place, because it's very easy to be a Christian when there's no persecution. It's easy to be a Christian when it's just lip serviced. It's easy to be a Christian in America when you're living in a country that has everything. And you live in a country where the sh people who live on the street, the bums and the beggars, they can just go into multi-million dollar places that are funded by the government to feed them. It's easy to be a Christian when you don't have to live out the principles of Christ. It's easy to be a Christian when you don't have to follow the teachings of the Master. It's easy to be a Christian in America with lip service, with this easy believism. But now, brothers and sisters, something has happened. Christians have a price on their head. Real Christians are being killed for their faith. Real believers are being killed, but the superficial Christians are abandoning ship left and right, hand over fist. Especially, especially when they were told that they would not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And a massive falling away occurred because untold millions of people who have been told all their lives that they would not be here find themselves in the midst of a period that the Bible says was has not been a period since the beginning of the world nor shall ever be again that's what the bible says they have found themselves in true tribulation now in the pre-trib scenario since the rapture has happened before all the trouble has happened before daniel's 70th week starts christians are gone and so it catches the world by surprise See, this is the scenario that the movies left behind and the books left behind. This is the narrative that has been put out by the Hollywood Christians for all these years. You know, there, there are going to be these pilots flying planes, and all of a sudden the planes are crashing because the pilots are gone. There are going to be uh, doctors disappearing mid-surgery. Cars are going to be driving themselves. Just a mass disappearing of people all over the world. And it's supposed all that was supposed to happen, and it does happen in the pre-trib scenario that just throws the entire world into chaos. Because the Christians are just taken all of a sudden. No one is expecting it because the 70th week of Daniel has not gotten here yet. And according to pre-trib, we just have to disappear on the rapture train, the secret rapture train. Problem with that is in with the pre-trib scenario, then you would have a chaotic world. You know, Christian pilots gone, so you would have all of this upheaval because all of the true Christians have been taken and everybody else were left behind, okay? But that's in the pre-trib scenario. You see, brothers and sisters, if the pre-trib scenario is correct, then fine. You know, I will be super thrilled to 
apologize to my brothers and sisters, pre-tribbers in heaven. You know, I will be happy to admit I was wrong. Happy. But brothers and sisters, what if, if pre-trib is wrong? What if pre-trib is wrong? You see, anytime you have masses of people believing in one thing or another, one doctrine, anytime the masses believe in something, the masses are usually wrong. You know, there were so, there was just so much mystery that surrounded the first advent, the first coming of Jesus Christ onto the earth. When Jesus came the first time, there was so much mystery surrounding that. The scripture said he'd be born in Bethlehem, but uh, Micah 5, 3 said, you know, he, he would be born in Bethlehem. But nobody could have, could have ever figured out, nobody could have imagined how God would have uh, brought that prophecy into fruition. Nobody could have understood or, pre or predicted how God would have fulfilled that prophecy. You see, we have a God that can fulfill prophecy and use everything and anything within the created universe to fulfill that prophecy. He has got, as the old song says for the children, he's got the whole world in his hands. God can use anything to fulfill prophecy. He can send an earthquake to change the course of history that nobody could begin to predict. You know, the way that God does things, the way that God makes this world turn and allows things to happen in each individual's lives to bring about his will is just incalculable. We cannot calculate it. The Bible says his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As the heavens is higher than the off, so is his ways and his thoughts above ours. Now, that is a paraphrase, of course, but we could have none predicted that the whole way that Jesus would become born in Bethlehem, the way that prophecy would be fulfilled would be because Augustus Caesar would declare a tax, a census that caused everybody to go to the city from which they were born. You know, nobody could have predicted that. Nobody. Now, you definitely won't get it from reading Micah. You, There is no way that Anyone could calculate that. You know, in other words, when God fulfills prophecy, he has any and everything in all of creation at his disposal. And he can use anything he wishes. That means human beings cannot figure him out. One of the main problems with pre-trib and we're going to get into the doctrine of free trib, but one of the most important messages that you ever hear concerning the rapture could come from tonight. But, brothers and sisters, there is absolutely no way that no human being can calculate how God is going to move. And that is the problem with free trib. They have this thing so, so scripted, it's written like a movie script. They have got the Lord scripted. They are trying to tell you exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, when this is going to happen. But brothers and sisters, when have the masses of people ever been right? When has the majority been right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, have the princes, if the princes of this world have known, they would not have crucified Christ. But the problem is they did not know. Brothers and sisters, neither do any of us know exactly how 
end times events are going to unfold. We can use the Bible as a, a kind of a map of the events, but as far as the way that they're going to unfold, only God knows. Only God knows. Jesus Christ said that no one knows, not even Him, only the Father who is in heaven concerning His return, when He would return. Now, men are good at creating their own doctrines and their own commandments for other men and women. But let me just say this. Let, let, me, let me break this down real quick. Doc, in uh, Dr. Woods' book, he's supposed to be sending me a copy of his book really soon. And I, I, I cannot wait to get it. I'm going to read it. I'm telling you, I, I'm so very happy that I found Dr. Woods, his Revelation Revolution podcast, and all of his work on end times prophecy. But he says in his first book, that he gives, uh, I guess, a theory, a theory, his theory, on what is going to happen in the end times. Now, he has a piece in that book called Modern Day Thessalonians. Now, if you remember that this, in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he was trying in Second Thessalonians he was trying to comfort them because there were people telling them that the day of the Lord had happened, and he was saying, "No, no, uh, you know, the day of the Lord has not happened." Well, in Doctor Jane, in Doctor Woods' book, he's he's got a letter called Modern Day Thessalonians, and. and it says, you know, we believe that Second Thessalonians was written because someone had, under the guise of apostolic authority, had written a letter to that congregation suggesting that the tribulation or the persecution or day of the Lord had, had happened because of the persecution that they were going through at that time. It, it's that what the letter said was that because the persecution that they were going through at that time was because they had entered into the 70th week of Daniel or the day of the Lord. And the theory goes, the theory goes because many of them felt that they were in the day of the Lord already, that obviously they had already missed the second coming of the Lord because First Thessalonians had already said that they were not appointed unto wrath and that the wrath of God is synonymous with the term the day of the Lord. So there was all kind of confusion going around in the in the church of Thessalonica. I mean, it'd be just like it's going to be here uh, because of the things that the pre-tribbers have uh, really programmed into our minds. When, you know, we've already seen this in history. We've already seen the way the Thessalonians reacted to this phenomenon. And it will happen again because, number one, pre-trib teaches that the entire 70th week of Daniel is the, the wrath of God. The whole thing is the day of the Lord, which is not the case. That is not true. It is not the case. Be but that's what they teach. And since they teach that all of Daniel's 70th week is the seven-year tribulation, since they teach that, they says that the rapture has to happen before the seven-year tribulation. Now, that is a theory. It hasn't happened. You know, they're all theories. Everybody's got a theory. I've got a theory. You've got a theory. It. And the reason that is, is because it hasn't happened yet. 
So everybody's opinion on this thing is just a theory, okay? But we don't know. We all have a theory. We are just human beings. And, and we are, you know, we're just here today and gone tomorrow. And that is what we are. We are mere men and women, mere human beings. So we don't know. But here's what happened before. We saw what happened to the Thessalonians when they believed that they had already, that the day of the Lord had already come. The pre-trib scenario is setting up, the pre-tribbers are setting up the same scenario to happen again. Because they teach that the entire 70th week of Daniel is the wrath of God. And because they teach that, when the things that happen at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel start happening, and the church is still here, they are going to be in the same situation the Thessalonians were in, in 2 Thessalonians, when they believed that they too had entered into the day of the Lord. Because that's what pre-trib teaches. If you are a pre-trib believer and you are here, then you believe you have entered into the wrath of the Lord and you have missed the rapture. You know, pre-trib says, we're not going to be here. We don't have to worry about any of these events in tribulation. You know, all the good Christians are going to be snatched away before the tribulation or the wrath of the Lord. But, brothers and sisters... What if it doesn't go down that way? If it doesn't go down that way, then there are going to be millions of Christians that are going to be here that thought they were going to be gone and they're now faced with persecution, not being able to buy or sell. And all of a sudden, what Paul predicted in 2 Thessalonians, there's going to come first a great falling away. I mean, it literally sets up the great falling away. The pre-trib doctrines of Tim LaHaye, Dr. Walvoord, uh, all of these pre-tribbers, Dr. Pentecost, all of these guys, John MacArthur, they are literally setting the church up for the great falling away. Ever since John Nelson Darby and the dispensationalist doctrine of all of the last 200 years, really, it has literally been setting the world up for the great falling away. Now, there is room for it to happen over time. The great falling away could happen over time. There's room for that. As the world gets more and more secular, the church gets more and more secular and self-centered and materialistic and new age. And you, uh, you, know, you have people who are Christians in name only. There's room for that. It can happen that way. But I believe, and you know, I've heard Dr. Dr. Woods, Dr. Dennis James Woods. I've also heard uh, Brother BDK. I've heard many people who literally teach the truth of scripture though without trying to put man-made interpretation and spin on it say the same thing that i believe and that is that it is going to happen at one time all at once it's going to catch people flat-footed off guard and it's going to set up the great deception and people are going to fall away because of the persecution that is coming particularly in places like America where Christians have not gone through any persecution. They are going to be devastated. This is the type of persecution that the first, second, and third century Christians knew all about because they lived with it day to day. And these people are just as much part of the body of Christ as we are today. The first century believers, you know how much I emphasize on the church needing to get back to a first century church kingdom Christianity. We need to get back to a, a 
a kingdom mindset like the first, second, and third century church had. The early church literally were going through the types of things that the last day's church will go through. Now, really, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, that's all you got to do. When Jesus told the church at Pergamos that Satan is going to throw some of you into prison, but Jesus said, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. Jesus didn't say I'm going to come and I'm going to bust you out of jail like I did Peter. He said, be faithful unto death and you will get a crown of life. We will be his faithful martyrs. And martyrs are the most profound witnesses. Now, there is, there is in Fox's Book of Martyrs the story of a man named Germanicus. And Dr. Dr. Woods tells this story in his podcast on, really, in his episode on the Restrainer. He tells the story of Germanicus. And Germanicus is, is right close to the persecution of Polycarp. It's in Fox's Book of Martyrs, but it is truly truly profound is something that is so so profound that we will definitely have to live through the same type of persecution we will definitely have to go through martyrdom there will be many of us who do not make it through the tribulation period see the tribulation period Contrary to popular dispensational belief, the tribulation period is not God's wrath on against the church or the world. It is literally Satan's persecution of the church. It is after the persecution and tribulation of the saints... That the wrath of God against the world and Satan and his angels are poured out. Brothers and sisters, this is definitely the history and the foundation of the church was founded on tribulation. We will go through persecution. You know, in America, we're not used to this type of thing. We don't have to go through it. We just think that everything is going to just be okay, hunky-dory. You know, they just, all we got to do is sit in a pew on Sunday and raise our hands and shout hallelujah and praise the Lord. And then we can go and live like the world for the rest of the week. That is what we believe Christianity is here in America. Because we have not had to go through persecution. But I'm going to tell you, God is going to allow us to go through this tribulation period because it will refine us. It is only when we are tested that we know what we are truly made of. Now, the Christianity of today that you see, especially here in the West, it would be unrecognizable to the church in the first, second, and third century. The early church would not even recognize what is called Christianity today as Christianity. It would be literally unrecognizable. And so we've got this whole scenario set up. We're all going to be, everything's going to be going on. And then all of a sudden the jets are going to fall out of the sky. Cars are going to crash because the Christians have taken from the world. The clothes are going to be piled up without the bodies. Blah, blah, blah. And then the tribulation happens because all 
of the good Christians are just going to be taken. And then God's going to pour out his wrath on the world. And then seven years later, we're going to come back and fight in the battle of Armageddon with Jesus. That's how pre-trib has it. But what if pre-trib is wrong? I've said it over and over. That is the question. So, enough with all of my setting this up. Enough with, with, with my preliminary remarks. Let's go to the Word of God and let's actually break this thing down. If you will, let's turn our attention to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. But even before we get there, let's, let me just say this really quick. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, 6 through 9. Thus have ye made the commandments of God none effect by your traditions. In vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines and the commandments of men. Now just think about that for a minute. Doctrines and commandments of men have made the word of God of no effect, null and void. Because, you know, we love, we love our pet doctrines. We love them. We love our man-made theology. We create them in our universities and in our seminaries. And we teach them in our churches. And they embody the doctrinal concepts and then they live it out through their Christian life just as they were taught in school. That's exactly how it goes. We teach it to our pastors, and then they teach it to the congregation, and it's lived out throughout people's lives, and it makes the Word of God to no effect. That's what Jesus said. That's not what I said. That's what Jesus said. Now, I just want you... To really think about that. Keeping your own doctrines and your own commandments of men, you make the word of God to no effect. Now, 2 Thessalonians, we're going to go back. Remember, I said 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him that you not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word of God nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then that man of sin be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Second Thessalonians chapter number 2 verses 1 through 8. Now, Here it is said, Let no man deceive you by any means, Paul says, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. 
Paul said there had to be a falling away come first. Now, remember in the introductory remarks, I was telling you what I believe is going to uh, really cause that falling away. And the pre-trib teachers have literally set up the world for that falling away. And, you know, the man of sin, the Antichrist, will be revealed after that. And it says he... Who, the man of sin who opposeth and exalts himself and he's going to sit in the temple and show himself to be God that is when the Antichrist is going to walk in to the Holy of Holies Revelation 13 says they are going to make a statue an image to the beast you know I talked about this in my first book I believe, I believe it was chapter 6 uh, don't quote me on that because I don't have it in front of me but in uh Origins of Evil, Book 1, Kabbalah, in, I think, Chapter 6, I talk about the uh, the false prophet, how he is going to, in my opinion, now this is just a theory, remember we talked about theories of men. Now there's a difference in having a theory and then making your own doctrine. Now see, if I told you that instead of, if I told you that this was, uh, what was definitely going to happen, you know, thus saith the Lord, instead of thus saith Jeremy, then I would be making the word of God to be of no effect. But that is not what I'm doing here. I'm telling you that my theory is, and I talk about this in my first book, that the false prophet is going to use Kabbalistic sorcery along with technology to cause the image of the be beast to live and speak and really is going to be you need to read uh, that chapter in the book it's uh, I literally I, I describe what is called a golem a golem in the Kabbalah is literally a statue or a image that is brought to life. And that is what the Bible describes happening in Revelation 13. And that is the abomination of desolation. When that image is brought to life and set in the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and people are made to worship it, or else they will be killed and they're caused to receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead, and that they must not they will not be able to buy or sell, save he who had the mark. That is the abomination of desolation. And, you know, that statue is going to be erected. Antichrist is going to walk in and he he's going to sit upon the mercy seat or the throne of God and you know, back in, in Old Testament times, in the first temple period, before the first temple period, you had the Ark of the Covenant, you had the two uh, the two cherubims facing one another, the wings facing one another, and you had the mercy seat, and that's the seat, that is the place of perpetuation, the place of God's mercy, and so he's going to walk into this temple, call himself God. They're going to set up this image. That is the abomination of desolation. That is the time that Jesus said, when you see that, if you are in Judea or the surrounding areas, flee. Jesus said, run into the mountains. Now, then he says something else. Paul says, that day shall not come unless a falling away happens first, that man of sin be revealed, son of perdition. He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple, show, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth. The Greek word there is is kitchu, what restrains. 
and now ye know what withholdeth from the King James that he may be revealed. For the mystery of iniquity be revealed. It already it is already at work. Only he who now restraineth, or he who now letteth, will let until he be taken out of the way. That okay now <laughs> all right let me read this from let me let me let's let me hop to the niv real quick that was king james let's go to the niv niv um let's see second thessalonians give me just a second I'm trying to get it pulled up here i wish i had my bible in front of me instead of this computer screen all right verse number seven for the power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy his splendor by his coming. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, let, let's read the NASB. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Okay, now. The question is, who is the restrainer? That is the question. Paul does not say here who the restrainer is. He doesn't say. The reason why he doesn't say it is clear. He said, because when I was with you before, I already told you. So why would he tell him again? So now, you and I, in modern day times... We got to fill in the blanks. We have to figure it out. That's what we have to do. But guess what? It can be done using the Word of God. So, pre-trib says, pre-tribbers, that the one who is now withholding the Antichrist is the Holy Spirit. That's right. The Holy Spirit. That's what they say. They say it's the Holy Spirit that is the restrainer. And if the Holy Spirit has to be taken out of the way, then the Holy Spirit is in the church. He's in the believers. He's inside you and he's inside me. So that means if the Holy Spirit has to be gone before the Antichrist can be revealed, and they say he is revealed at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week because he has to sign a covenant, even though the word revealed does not mean show up, it means to uncover. He's not uncovered really until the middle of the week. But anyway, he has to be removed. This he, whatever it is, has to be removed. The restrainer has to be removed and it has to be taken out of the way or removed before the Antichrist can be revealed. So they say, who then is the he? Because Paul didn't say. So pre-trib, this is what they do. They say, okay, well, let's do some investigations. Let's work here. Let's look. Let's look at who we think this could be. Who could be the restrainer? They go down the list through some historical interpretations. They say, number one, the restrainer could be the Roman Empire. Mm, no, nah, that doesn't work. The Roman Empire has was out of control for centuries now, so that doesn't work. So it can't be the Roman Empire. All right, the second thing, maybe it's the Jewish state. Hmm, mm, I don't think that can be it either. Number three, Satan himself. Well, then they say, well, Satan is not going to restrain Satan, so that's not it. Then, so number four, the principle of law and order found in human government. Hmm, nah, that doesn't work either. Number five, God. Uh, number six, the Holy Spirit. And finally, number seven, the true church as indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Now, what what I just quoted you from is, I, I read it from 
the the believers commentary but you know I, I i also use a lot of john MacArthur's stuff this is dispensational sources i want and I, i'm just showing you what they say they say the holy spirit indwelling the church and in the individual believer seems to fit the description of the restrainer more completely and accurately than any of the others any of the others being any of the other six. Just as the restrainer is clearly someone or something in this chapter, so the Spirit is spoken as both someone and something and the masculine he in the book of John. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, please understand, pre I, want you, I want you to understand what pre-trip teaches. Okay, first of all, let's go back. Paul never says who the restrainer was. He doesn't say. And this is important. This is very important that you understand that this fundamental fact, Paul didn't say who the restrainer is. So since he didn't say, theologians have proposed who it possibly could be. One, the Roman Empire, two, the Jewish state, Satan, principle law and order and human government, God, the Holy Spirit, and then the one they opt for is the Holy Spirit indwelled in the church. But where did this idea come from? Because that's not what it says in the Bible. You will not find it in the text. This idea comes from what the commentator, like John MacArthur and all of these commentators, the Holy Spirit indwelling the church inside the individual believer seems to fit the description of the believer more completely and accurately than any of the others. Well, the others that they proposed, like the Roman Empire, the Jewish state, Satan, principle of lawless, man, let me tell you, the other, the other options that they give, listen, oh my gosh, brothers and sisters, they are the one who proposed these things and then the last one they throw in as the Holy Spirit in the church but this is their conjecture it's not that the Bible says any of these things the average person that believes pre-trib does not understand that this concept is based off of a theological conjecture of who the restrainer is you have to understand that. There is no scripture that says the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. This is men that say this. Now, the proof text that they use, now, I, 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 from the believer's commentary, I'm reading from the believer's commentary, the Holy Spirit indwelling the church in the individual seems to fit the description of the restrainer more clearly and accurately than any of the others. In other words, it seems to do it better than any of the other words. So, in other words, this seems to work better than the others. Okay. It says that, it says here, that just as the restrainer is spoken as someone and something in this chapter, so it is spoken of in John. I mean, this is the proof text for the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read each one of these passages for you. John 14, 26, John 15, 26, John 16 and 8, 13 and 14, as both neuter, talking about the Holy Spirit being referred to the mask referred to in the masculine and that type of thing. As early as Genesis 6, 3, the Holy Spirit is spoken of in connection to restraining evil. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's go and look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Let's look at it. This is what Genesis 6, 3 says. That, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, some kind of way, they get that the Holy Spirit is restraining evil here. I don't see it. But from that text, somehow they get the Holy Spirit restraining evil. But 
let me say this. If that was the case, if the Holy Spirit was truly restraining evil here, then why would God have to send a flood? He wouldn't have needed to send a flood, right? If the Holy Spirit was restraining this evil, then why did God flood the world? This text does not say anything about the Holy Spirit restraining evil. It says nothing about that. The fact is that wickedness was so bad on the earth and the genetic manipulation was so rampant that people's genetics were so corrupted from the Nephilim and the interbreeding and all of the sin against animals and nature that, that is talked about in the extra biblical sources that God literally had to kill everything. He had everything except for the eight that were on the ark. Everything that had the breath of life in their lungs. That means every animal, human, Nephilim, everything. Everything. Now, how do you get the Holy Spirit restraining evil, evil from Genesis 6, chapter 3? All right, let's go to the next text. John 14, 26. Now, this is what it says. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, this has got nothing to do with restraining Nothing to do with the Antichrist, nothing to do with eschatology, nothing to do with restraining of evil. But the point that they're using here is, is that the Holy Spirit is re being referred to here as the He, as He. These are their proof text. Next one, John 15, chapter 26. I mean, John 15, verse 26. Now the Comforter, and when the Comforter has come, which I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Again, they're showing the use of the masculine pronoun, he. But this text does not say anything about the Antichrist. It has nothing to do with restraining evil. Nothing to do with end times Bible prophecy. Nothing. But this is one of their proof texts. It is laughable. It is laughable. One of the very first things that you ever learn in hermeneutics is that you stick to the genre and you stick to the text. You don't stray from the text. All right, the next proof text, John 16, 8. And when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin. Masculine pronoun again, he. John 16, 7 to 11. Nevertheless, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him, using the masculine pronoun again, him unto you. And when he comes unto you, he will reprove the world of all sin. They are just using these texts to show that the Holy Spirit is called a he. They are only trying to... to to bring these two texts together simply because of the use of the masculine pronoun he. But that is simply, oh my goodness, this is the biggest straw man argument that I have ever seen. I mean, remember, they have to connect the dots. They have to try to connect the dots on who is this he. They're trying to make an argument here about the Holy Spirit being the restrainer. And the best they can come up with is the fact that all of these scriptures call the Holy Spirit a he? Well, I could have told you that. I mean, come on now. That's got nothing to do with restraining the lawless one. All right, let's go to the next text. 1 John 4 and 4. Hear of God, little children, you have overcome because greater is, is he that is within you than he that is in the world. 
This has got nothing to do with the Antichrist, nothing to do with the apocalyptic literature, nothing to do with the restraining of evil, nothing at all. But this is the best one they have. Isaiah 59, 19. So when they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the setting sun and the enemy shall come in, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So, so that, and that's the King James translation. So what you are getting here from the KJV is that the enemy is going to come in here and the the Holy Spirit is going to literally they're saying they're saying that the Holy Spirit is going to literally you know just wipe out the enemy like a flood and so they are using that to say that the Holy Spirit is restraining evil here but first of all and I pointed this out Friday when I did this program live this you can only come up with that here in this text using the King James Version. That is the only translation of Scripture that you can find this in. The word for lift up the standard is nus or noose. And what it means is to flee away. It's translated one time, is used 142 times as flee, 12 times to run away, it's used one time as lift up a standard, and that's the verse. The primitive root of flit means to vanish away, to abate, to flight, to run away. It does not mean to restrain. It's two different things. Two very different things. If I repel somebody and turn them around, that's one thing. If I put handcuffs on them and restrain them that's something else i mean you can ask any police officer and they'll tell you that when somebody's running for him it is not the same thing as when he restrains them it ain't the same thing it's just not besides listen how this reads in the niv and nasv from the west the people will fear the name of the lord and from the rising of the sun they will reverse his glory Oh, excuse me, sorry, revere his glory. The, the day will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. That is how that should be interpreted. The breath of the Lord drives along. That is completely different than restrain, brothers and sisters. That's not restraining. The breath of the Lord driving along, that's not restraining. The breath is the ruach. Breath and spirit are often interpreted as the same thing because they literally mean the same thing. So, this is, oh my goodness. They love the King James translation because in that one instance, that Hebrew word is translated as lift up a standard. But even lift up a standard, it does not mean restrain. Lifting up a standard is, in and of itself does not mean restrain. But, brothers and sisters, you know, I, I have just read to you the all the proof text, all of the proof text that pre-trivers use to prove that the he in 2 Thessalonians is the Holy Spirit. Now, now, I cannot put it any more plainly than this. This, that dog don't hunt. I, I'm just going to say it the way we say it here in the South. You know, I, I, I said this in the live version. I got called a redneck. Somebody said I sounded like a redneck in the, uh, on the deception report chat when I called in to the deception report the other night. Well, in redneck terminology for the pre-trib doctrine and their proof text of how this is the Holy Spirit, that dog don't hunt. So, I mean, brothers and sisters, that's just the way it is. This 
is the flimsiest argument that I've ever heard for anything, really. I mean, I, I, I could... I could really say that and not be exaggerating. This is one of the flimsiest arguments I have ever seen used to prove anything. Brothers and sisters, let okay, let me let me ask you something. Let, let, let's the the proof text that they use have nothing to do let's Genesis six and three and John, all of these proof texts that I have just read to you, literally, they have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit restraining evil. They, they literally, it's frustrating. And I, I tell you what, you try to have a debate with the pre-tribber, I, I mean, I, I could debate any pre-tribber. I, I know I could because I know the scriptures well enough. I could sit down and debate John MacArthur. You know, I I could sit down and debate John Hagee. I'd love to sit down and debate someone like Hagee. He's not even, I wouldn't even put him in the category of a dispensationalist brother or sister. I would put him in the category almost of a reprobate. But that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, I, I'm not going to... Uh, say anything more about people like that tonight but I, if you've ever watched a debate between someone who is letting the scriptures uh speak for themselves and not trying to read their own doctrines into the word of god if you've ever seen a debate between them and a dispensationalist theologian it'll make your head hurt and I am going to ask you guys to just be logical. I'm going to ask you right now. You heard all of these proof texts that I read. I read it straight from dispensational sources, straight from their own text, their own books. Brothers and sisters, does the text that I read to you do any of them have anything to do with the Antichrist. Anything to do. I'm not asking you if it proves the Holy Spirit as the restrainer or not. I'm asking you even simpler questions than that. Does it have anything to do with end times Bible prophecy or the Antichrist? No, it does not. Do any of them have anything to do with end times prophecy? No. Do any of them have to do with the restraining of the Antichrist? No. The reason why these scriptures are used is because the Holy Spirit is called a he. That's, that's as close as they could get. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah 59b does not support the restraining ministry of the Holy Spirit if you read it in any other version. But they do not use key passages. Come on, they, they, they use all of these passages of Scripture to prove that the Holy Spirit is who Paul was talking about in 2 Thessalonians because Paul uses the, the uh, masculine pronoun he, and all of these Scriptures that are talking about the Holy Spirit use the masculine pronoun he, so they must then be the same person. But I could take you to a million scriptures talking about anybody else. Anybody else that used the masculine pronoun he. That weren't talking about the Holy Spirit. And I could compare them to 2 Thessalonians because they used the masculine pronoun he. That argument can be used for any other person besides the Holy Spirit. But there are key passages of Scripture in the Bible that were ignored. They completely ignored the passages of Scripture that deal specifically with the person of the man of sin, the person of the Antichrist. They don't use these key passages about the Antichrist that are in Revelation key passages from Daniel. This is the issue, brothers and sisters. If you are talking about the Antichrist and finding out what's restraining the Antichrist, 
don't it make sense to go to the part of the Bible that's actually talking about the Antichrist? I mean, you don't have to have a master's degree in, therm in theology, a master's degree in eschatology, a master's degree in hermeneutics to figure these things out. I mean, oh my goodness, this, this makes my head hurt. It literally makes my head hurt. Why would you try to use Isaiah 59.9b knowing that that translation, that that passage of scripture has nothing to do with the Antichrist? Why would you use all of these, these proof texts that they have used when there are actual scriptures that talk about the Antichrist and that actually talk about the restraining of evil. Why do they not go to the passage of scripture that deals specifically with the Antichrist? And the next question is, is there any scripture in the Bible that give us solid, solid clues as to who this restrainer is because in the final analysis pre-trib says that he is the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit has to be taken away before the Antichrist can be revealed pre-trib teaches that the Antichrist will be revealed at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week when he signs this peace covenant so I want you to understand this logic if you understand the logic then you'll be able to follow me when we go through the Bible and I show you who the restrainer actually is. Infallible proof. Not, not taking scriptures that have nothing to do with Antichrist or end times Bible prophecy. Nothing to do with restraining evil. All of the texts they use have nothing to do with that. But we are going to look at infallible proof from texts that literally show the restrainer and show who is restraining the Antichrist but brothers and sisters before you can even begin to understand and know who is restraining the Antichrist who the restrainer is before you can understand that you have to understand what is you have to understand what is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? There are three aspects of the beast. Now, we are going to use the term beast because that is what Revelation uses. He, it, it uses the word therion, which just means a wild beast, you know, You've heard me talk about uh, the book that I have been working on for a long time now, trying to write Therion Rising, which is, you know, it is, was going to be a uh, fictional account of end times Bible prophecy, kind of like the Left Behind series, but without the dispensational part. But of course, if you've heard me talk about it, the Lord, uh, you know, specifically told me that that, I mean, he didn't speak to me audibly, but the way that it, it has just not worked out, I have seen that it, it just does not seem to be the will of the Lord for me to write this book. In any case, we are going to start with the first two, the first two aspects of the Antichrist, because there are three aspects to the beast. Now, first off... There is the kingdom of the beast. The kingdom aspect of the Antichrist. Now, if you go quickly to Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, we will see the kingdom of the beast here. Now, the text says, we're going to read from the New King James here, that, that I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads 
a blasphemous name. Now, the beast which thou saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So now we see that the dragon, or Satan, gave him his throne, his political seat, his authority, his political and military power, the ten crowns, okay? Let's go to Revelation chapter 17, okay? All right, verse number nine says, Here is one that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings, listen to this, five are fallen, one is, and the other one has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Okay, so now, verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they will receive authority one hour with the beast. And these are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast so we see that the beast is a kingdom there is a confederation of ten kings okay ten kingdoms and through these ten kingdoms they will all give their power to one king one kingdom so you have the kingdom aspect of the beast that is the first aspect then you have the human dictator aspect of the beast okay let's go to to the old testament let's go to daniel chapter 7 verse 8 daniel 7 verse 8 verse 8 this is what it says all right Actually, let's go up to verse 7. Let's go up to verse 7. All right. It says, After this, I saw... You know what? Let's just go all the way back to verse 1. Let's just start from the beginning because I want to show you this. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, I, Daniel, had a dream and visions. And I... Hold on. I just lost my place completely. Okay, sorry. I, I know you guys can probably hear the dog in the background. Um, I, hopefully, I I shouldn't have even said that because I probably could have edited it out. I apologize. I, it, it made me lose my place, though. The dog made me <laughs> lose my place. All right, it says, Daniel had a dream and visions while upon his bed, and he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. And I saw in my night vision the four great beasts came up from the sea, each one different from the other. The first one was like a lion, and he had eagle's wings. And I watched until his wings were plucked off, and he was lifted up from the earth. And he was made to stand up on two feet like a bear. And then came up another beast like a, unto a bear. He had three ribs in his mouth between his teeth, and he said, Rise, devour much flesh. And I looked, and behold, I saw another beast that was like unto a leopard. And the beast had four heads. And after this, in the vision, I saw the full beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong, and it had huge iron teeth and he was breaking in pieces and trampling in residue with his feet and he it was different from all the other beasts before it for it had ten horns now see look here is the ten horns again same from revelation and i was considering the horns and then there was another little horn coming up among them from where three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots and there in this horn were eyes like unto a man and a mouth speaking great blasphemies. So now we're talking about the human 
monarch aspect of the beast. We're talking about a human man, a king, who is blaspheming God. So, you know, then if we continue all the way down to verse 24 and 25, this is what it says. It says, the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after that. He shall be different from the first one. He shall subdue three kings and speak, and speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall, uh, and shall intend to change the times and the seasons. And the saints shall be given unto his hands for a time and times and half a time. Okay, This is talking about the career of the Antichrist. This is Daniel's version of the ten horns. This is Daniel's version of the career of the beast. Now, if we go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, glory to the Most High, verse number 4, talking about the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God. So we know that the beast is a kingdom. It is a confederation of ten horns, ten kingdoms. On those horns, John saw ten crowns because these were ten kings. These were ten kings. This Ten Kingdom Federation is going to control the world. And we also saw the second aspect of the beast, which is the human king. This, these ten kings are going to consolidate their power and give it unto one king. This human king, this human man, human monarch, who is going to stand in the temple and blaspheme God. He's going to make war with the saints. He is going to persecute the church. He is going to walk into the temple of God, sit on the throne of God, and call himself God. That is the human part of the beast. But brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, get ready. Get ready for a ride. There is a third part to the beast and unless you understand the third part of the beast unless you can grasp the third aspect of the beast you cannot understand what is restraining him you can't understand what's restraining the beast are you ready i hope so let's bring the truth from the scriptures Let's break it on down. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. We're going to begin at verse number 7. Verse number 7. Listen to the text. But the angel saith unto me, talking about John, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Footnote, this is the same beast that we saw rising up out of the sea of people in Revelation chapter 13. Seven heads, ten horns. It's the same ten horn kingdom that Daniel saw in chapter number 7. And Daniel, we saw... Four beasts rising, one that like a bear, one that like a leopard, one that like a lion. Then, Revelation 13, it says, The beast that thou sawest has seven heads and ten horns. Well, those are the similarities in the characteristics uh, that, will that will show and solidify the ancient kingdoms with the modern, and it will... You will see the, the two aspects of prophecy merge. You will have what happened in the, 
the early first century church merging with what is going to take place in the future of Bible prophecy. And you will see all this merging and coming together in one in one in well one image really and we we can look at it here if we just go into the text we see in revelation chapter 17 the angel says to john he's the angel says to him why did you marvel why did you marvel you do not why are you wondering you don't have to wonder i will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast so he's going to tell John the mystery. He's going to tell him the mystery. Verse number 8. Listen here. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was is not and yet is oh brothers and sisters that is deep we're going to break this thing down and see just what the angel meant when he says the beast that was and is not and rises up out of the bottomless pit. But I want to divert our attention to the first part of that verse for now. Verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. The third aspect of the beast, the third aspect, brothers and sisters, there is an aspect of the beast that is in the bottomless pit. Right now, it is imprisoned in the pit. The question is, what is the bottomless pit? What is the bottomless pit? What is... The bottomless pit. And in the Greek, it is called the abusos, the abyss. And, and we can now see and find what is the bottomless pit now this this is a quote from the complete word dictionary the complete word study dictionary the complete word study dictionary says revelation 9 1 and 2 and 11 7 and 17 and 8 20 verses 1 and 3 it is a prison in which evil powers are confined and out of which they can at times be let loose. It is not the lake of fire, as in Revelation, nor is Satan regarded as being cast into this prison forever, but only to be so cast for 1,000 years. And we're going to read about that here in a minute. So... This isn't me telling you this. The bottomless pit is a prison for demonic, angelic spirits. It's a prison for fallen, angelic beings and demonic spirits. So, what do we mean by a prison for angelic spirits, fallen spirits? Now, D.A. Carson says that one of the most important things 
You can never learn in teaching and studying Bible prophecy is uh, be very very careful about creating doctrines around apocalyptic literature. And that is very, very important. That is an important tenet. So, where else do we find this concept, this place referred to, this bottomless pit? Let's go and look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Peter 2 and 4. He says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So God has a place, He has a prison, that He puts fallen angels and principalities, and He chains them up in Tartarus. And that is that is a, a, what another translation calls it. In Second Peter here, it, it says Tartarus. In, in that translation, it actually said hell. But another translation is Tartarus. In the Greek, it is Tartarus. In, uh, let's see here. Another, another text is Jude. Chapter 1 and 6, or just Jude 6, because there's only one chapter in Jude. So Jude 6, and the angels that kept not their first estate, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains, in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. There it is again, angels being reserved in chains. But the most impactful scripture we find is in the book of Revelation. Chapter number 20. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 4. Now, I want you to read this with me, brothers and sisters, because it is very important. This is important. Verse number 1. New King James. Then I saw an angel. Coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. Point number one, the bottomless pit is a place of locked imprisonment. Point number two, angels have charge over the bottomless pit. Let's read it again. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Listen to this. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent of, who is called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Verse number three. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him, him away and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. Verse number seven. And when the thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from his prison. From where? From his prison. There it is again, brothers and sisters. The bottomless pit is a prison. Because it is a prison, it is a locked place of detention, of restraint. It is a locked place of detention that an angel has the keys to. And the angel has the chain. That restrains Satan. Now, we're not talking about the Antichrist here. We're talking about Satan himself, who is sealed up. 
locked in an inescapable airtight where his deceptive powers could not even get out to even deceive anybody when Satan is locked in the bottomless pit for a thousand years and the Lord is ruling and reigning here during the millennial reign, do you know that it is going to almost be like paradise again with no temptation? It, it'll be like the devil does not exist. And for that thousand years, he really won't exist. Yet he will exist. He's not out of existence. He's just off the earth, locked in an inescapable prison designed for demonic spirits and fallen angels. Now, if Satan, the chief principality and power, cannot escape from the bottomless pit, my question is, how then is the spirit that is also in the bottomless pit that John, that the angel told John, let's go back to it. Let's go back to it. Revelation chapter 17, verse number 7. The angel said, Why did thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which had seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Brothers and sisters, he's in the bottomless pit. So if he's in the bottomless pit, how does he get out? How did he get in there to begin with? And how is he going to get out? Who is restraining him? The answer is simply obvious. The angel that has charge of the bottomless pit. The same angel that is going to grab Satan himself and lock him up, set a seal on him for a thousand years, is the same angel that is restraining Antichrist. The same one. Now, brothers and sisters, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. Now, when pre-trib is was coming up with their doctrines what did they do what did they do pre-trib said who's restraining antichrist how do we find it they didn't go to revelation chapter 17 revelation 17 would have told them all they needed to know told them where the antichrist is told them he's in the bottomless pit we'd have found out what the bottomless pit was they they wouldn't found out if they would have just went to the scriptures that had to do with Antichrist. The thing that John didn't know on his own that the angel had to show him was that there was another aspect of the beast. John couldn't see it because it was literally locked up in the bottom of his pit. So John could not see it. The angel had to reveal it to him that there was a third aspect of the beast. That's why the Bible said he was, in other words, he was active prior to John's day, but in John's day, he is not. In other words, he's inactive, locked up in the bottomless pit, but in the future, he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So, how does he get out of the bottomless pit? I mean, does he break out? Is it like a prison break? Or, I mean, uh, 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 does Lucifer come bust him out? Do they have some kind of jailbreak? I don't think so. How does he get out of there? He don't bribe one of the angels. Of course not. He is imprisoned. In a prison that God made to be inescapable. But when pre was coming up with their theories, why in the world did they not use the information that's given in Revelation? about where the beast comes from. Why would they not tell people this? Why would they not tell people there's three aspects of the beast? A kingdom, a man, and a spirit. The man cannot become the beast until the spirit that is in the bottomless pit is let out. The spirit of lawlessness that is talked about in 2 Thessalonians until it's let out. And it enters into him. But pre-trib doesn't use any of this information. 
any of the information that the Bible just plainly gives us about the restraint of the Antichrist. It does not give it. No, what they do is they build a theory without using the material that the Bible has, but they jump over to Genesis chapter 6 and take you to a passage that has nothing to do with Antichrist, nothing to do with eschatology, nothing to do with the beast, nothing at all. And they compare it, they go there and they compare it with other scriptures like Isaiah 59 and try to use a bad translation of one word to try to make it say, see, this is the Holy Spirit restraining. Then they go to John and say, see, it's calling him a he, and so is Paul. Paul calls him a he, John calls him a he, it must be the same he. They go through all of those contortions to create a doctrine that the he of Thessalonians, chapter 2, is the Holy Spirit, and Paul never said it. Now, Paul doesn't say it's an angel either. But when we apply precept upon precept, line upon line, and let Scripture interpret Scripture, we see that the Bible definitely tells us this. Just because Paul doesn't say it himself, we see it. The angel says it here to John in Revelation chapter 17. He tells him explicitly. Now, I want you to do one more thing. Now, I am going to say this. this I'm, I, I'm getting close to ending this program here, and I, I hope that you guys are, are still listening. I'm getting close to an end. I think, well, I, I don't think anything. The Bible has clearly proven that the restrainer of lawlessness is an angel using a, the prison of the bottomless pit and a chain. That is what is uh, restraining lawlessness. It is an angel. Now, that is fact straight from the Word of God. That is not my opinion. That is not my theory. That is a fact from the Word of God. Now, we are going to go a little further, and I will give you what is my theory on the identity of this angel. It is quite plain and clear that it is an angel. It is definitely an angel that is the restrainer. But using key texts from both the Old and New Testament, the places where we go to find out about prophecy, which is the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, I'm going to show you how I believe we can see who the identity of this angel is. Now, I want you to go to Daniel. Go to Daniel. Go to chapter 11. And um, let's see. Let's look at the... the uh, well, we can just... I, I'll just tell you that in Daniel chapter 11 here, it is literally describing um, things that are happening up on... throughout the tribulation we see the antichrist and his earthly reign while he is a man going on here in daniel chapter 11 we see this king battling other kings on the earth here in daniel chapter 11 we can see his really his reign as a man in daniel chapter 11 and then as the chapter comes to an end it, it says in verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him, right? Well, the book of Revelation talks about a deadly head wound that will happen to the Antichrist when he is a man. Will happen to the beast. It's, it's a, the second part of the beast that was... And is not, and yet is, or was, is, or, hold on now, <laughs> was, is not, but will be again. There we go. There we go. I'm sorry, I said it a little wrong. 
but that, that's the second part to it. Usually there is a dual meaning and a dual fulfillment in prophecy. The, the physical aspect of the beast is the fact that he is a man alive, so he was. Then he gets a deadly head wound and is killed, so he is not. But then he is revived by the indwelling of Satan himself, and so he will be again. Then we look at the spiritual aspect that we talked about earlier. The spirit of Antichrist that is locked in the bottomless pit, who was in times old, might as well say in antediluvian times, in pre-flood times, before the flood, before God judged the watchers, put them down in chains in Tartarus that we saw in Jude 6. The beast that was, but is not in John's time when John is writing, but yet will be again when he ascends out of the bottomless pit, when an angel sets him free with the keys. Now, turn to Daniel chapter 12. We saw that he comes to his end, or he gets this deadly head wound at the end of Daniel 11.45. But then, Daniel chapter 12, I want you to see here is this angel. We just saw in Revelation how this angel was going to ascend or descend down with the keys to the bottomless pit. Well, right here in Daniel chapter 12, we see, and at that time, at what time? Because remember now, in the original text of the Bible, there was no chapter or verses. So immediately after verse 45 happened, it would have just flowed right in to Daniel chapter 12. Immediately after chapter 11, there would have, I mean, there was no chapters. So it would have just flowed into saying that at the time of the death of this beast, this deadly head wound, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of tribulation such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and will never be again. Jesus talks about the same time here in Matthew 24. And at that time, thou people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now, I want you to also turn now to Revelation chapter 12. We saw in uh, Daniel chapter 12, Michael, the great prince of the, the people of God, the Israel of God, which we now know Israel is a spiritual people. Dispensational theology would have you to believe that it is still the blood, flesh and blood uh, people that are living over in the Middle East. But you won't find that in Scripture. The Bible says there is no Greek nor Jew that is in Christ Jesus. In the church, in the kingdom, there is only the Israel of God. The Israel of God is are those who walk in the kingdom, the remnant of his people. Now turn to Revelation Chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, we see, uh, let's see, where are we going to start? Um, let's go down to uh, Revelation 12, verse 7, chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not. And neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, we see Michael standing up in Daniel chapter 12. We see Michael fighting against Satan himself in Revelation chapter 12 because that is his job. When we go back to Daniel, we can go back to Daniel. Uh, oh, 
I want to say it's Daniel chapter 8. We're about to find out. And we can see that Michael again is fighting with the principality here. Michael is fighting with the fallen angel that is called the Prince of Persia in Daniel. I'm not going to turn back to it. Uh, I, I, I hope you're familiar with the verse, but if you're not, you can go back and, and, and look through Daniel and you will see that uh, Michael is mentioned more than just in chapter 12. He's also mentioned when he comes to Daniel, when Daniel is praying, and then Michael comes to him, but on his way to him, he is confronted by a fallen principality, and he has to do battle with him, because that is what Michael does. Michael is the uh, captain of the heavenly host. He is the archangel of the Lord. You know, he is who is seen as doing battle with the fallen angels. That is what Michael does. And so to me, it is only logical that this angel that is obviously from the text the uh, restrainer. We see without a shadow of a doubt that the restrainer is an angel. So to me, it is only logical that this angel is the angel that we see battling with the fallen angels and Satan over and over. And we see him standing up right after the uh, Antichrist gets his deadly head wound and he has to be indwelled by the beast, which we find that the third aspect of the beast comes from the bottomless pit. And that is when this angel ascends down from heaven with the keys. So to me, it's only common sense that this angel is the archangel Michael. But I will admit that that part of it is just my opinion. That is just a theory of mine. But what is not a theory of mine, what is plain from the word of God, is that dispensational theology showing that the, the restrainer is the Holy Spirit is false. It is 100% false. The text clearly shows that the restrainer is an angel. That the spirit of lawlessness is being restrained right now in the bottomless pit. And it is an angel that comes down and releases this spirit of lawlessness so that it can go and indwell the human aspect of the Antichrist and he will become the beast or the Therion who will get his power and his authority from the dragon who Jesus Christ calls the God of this world. You see, Satan made this offer to another man. Satan offered all the kingdoms of this world to our Lord and Savior, who was a man. He was 100% man and 100% God. And Satan tempted him. He told him that if he would just bow down and worship him, that he would give him, he told him that he had been given authority over all of the nations of the world and that he would give it all to Jesus if he would just bow the knee to him. And of course we know that our Lord was tempted but fell not because when Satan tempted him, Jesus quoted the word of God to the devil. Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God only, and him only shall thou serve. So, Satan, again, here in the end times, is going to, all, he couldn't get Christ to worship him, but he will get Antichrist to bow the knee and when antichrist bows the knee then he will be indwelled by the spirit of lawlessness and it will no longer be restrained because the restrainer will be moved out of the way he will no longer restrain because he will open the keys he will open the prison gates he will let the spirit out brothers and sisters we are coming up on the very end of the program today. 
And I hope that each and every one of you listened to the words that I have said to you tonight. I have tried my very best to prove from the text that these things that I uh, am saying to you are 100% true. All I can do is pray <laughs> that you all truly listened, listened to what I said. I pray that you followed along in the text, and I hope that you can see the lies of dispensationalism and that you will put them behind you, put these doctrines of men, these doctrines of demons, because when it comes down to it, I believe that there is no difference between one or the other. Uh, you know, where does a man get the idea to make a doctrine that goes against the word of God, if not from a demon? So to me, there is no difference between the doctrines of men and the doctrines of demons. Uh, you know, I don't think that I could possibly make this any clearer. I do pray that each one of you will tune in to this Friday's live edition of the remnant report you know we are we always have a, a, a remnant report edition live each friday and this friday is absolutely no different we will be having the remnant report live this friday at 6 p.m eastern standard time and this friday we will be talking about the nifb the new ifb and exactly what happened to Todd Ferguson. If you haven't been paying attention, brothers and sisters, Todd Ferguson literally, in my opinion, was a martyr for Jesus Christ. The man was murdered. It is that much is clear if people, if we could just get the authorities to investigate it. But even if the authorities won't investigate it, we know that we serve a God in heaven that Every man will have to one day stand in front of. One day, every man will stand before God. And the Bible tells us that vengeance is the Lord's. So even if judgment is not gotten on this earth and Todd does not see justice, we know that in the end, justice will be delivered by God. I know that there will be a lot of you who have never heard of either the new IFB or the name Todd Ferguson. So I hope that that will uh, at least pique your interest enough to come and watch Friday's live edition of the Remnant Report where we will see what this... Uh, split off of the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church is, because that's what it is, the IFB, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, it split. And, you know, for whatever reason, we will find out Friday what caused the split, maybe. We'll find out, and we'll also find out what is the new IFB. What are their doctrines? What are these people teaching? What do they preach from their pulpits? Todd Ferguson made it his mission to expose these people and expose the things happening in this group. Let me tell you something. Just because a man stands up and claims the name Jesus Christ, claims to be a Christian, and he's got a following of however many thousands on YouTube and Facebook. That doesn't make him right. That doesn't make him a man of God. And that doesn't make him right 
or truthful just because he has a huge following and just because he's got a doctrinal denomination, excuse me, I meant to say denominational name attached to him doesn't mean that he is teaching sound doctrine. And so we are going to go and we are going to find out just what these people are, just who they are and what they are teaching. And then we are going to talk about what happened to Todd Ferguson. We are going to have none other than Todd Ferguson's best friend and partner on the Reason Files, which is uh, Robert Tuttle. He is going to be coming on with us to discuss all of the things and the shenanigans that are taking place inside the new IFB and just why someone would have a reason to kill our brother Todd Ferguson. And, you know, Robert is not saying that any of these pastors from the new IFB killed Todd or even had him killed. We're not saying that. I'm not saying that. But we are going to look at why someone would want to have killed Todd. And he was killed. You know, the evidence shows that. And we're going to look at why someone might want to go and kill him, maybe because of some of the hate that these people spout out of their mouths from their pulpits. I don't know. We will see. You'll just have to come and find out this Friday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on the Remnant Report. Okay, my dear brothers and sisters, for the Next Chapter Radio Network and Kingdom Productions, I am the Remnant Report. I, I am the Remnant Report. I am the Remnant Warrior. Saying until next time, grace and peace and good night.